Hello and welcome to Multifamily Investing Made Simple, the podcast that's all about taking the complexity out of real estate investing so that you can take action today. I'm your host, Anthony Vecino of Invictus Capital, joined as always by Dan, let's keep this brief, Krueger. That's what they call me, straight <laughs> to the point. No fluff. Full of points. All meat. Just cut the fat. Thick slab of meat. <laughs> we don't have any meat. Maybe that should have been your nickname. Dan Thick Slab of Meat Krueger. Ooh, no, 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 we're not we're not going with that one. I kind of like that one. I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna put that on a plaque. Mm, no. So so Dan, what's new, man? How's life? Life's good. Life is busy, but uh I would have it no other way. If I'm not busy, I uh am not happy. Gotta be busy with projects. I thrive when there's a lot of things to do and problems to solve. So busy, but happy. How are you? Good. I am not busy, but happy. You're doing all the work. So it's great for me. <laughs> well, what are you doing right now? I don't know. I'm trying to do stuff, <laughs> launch a book. And, yeah, no, that's <laughs> no a big thing. deal. No biggie. Uh, <laughs> so, I mean, I, I like to, yeah, I like to be active, I like doing stuff. Um, and this has been a really crazy month. So July, I thought was a crazy month. We closed on a couple of properties. And now this month we have another property under contract and we have the book that's launched and just travel. It's, it's all sorts of craziness, but it's good craziness. I wouldn't change it for the world. Exactly. So today though, you know, this has been a, this has been a crazy ride this, these last two months, but I, I thought it'd be really cool to revisit our beginnings go back to the Mm. beginning for an episode and i think we've talked a lot about our personal origin stories before we like our very first episode of multifamily investing made simple is our origin stories um i thought it'd be cool to talk about more our origin story from the company perspective of like invictus and how we as partners came to be in one another's sphere and and how invictus is formed and really like what that that journey has been like because i don't know if we've really talked about that a lot like really what the timeline was and what it and how it came to be um mm-hmm. but before we get to that now that we've buried the lead and everybody's like oh i want to know more about their stories like i'm super interested tell me more anthony nah nope can't we gotta wait first we have to have our bad investing advice of course of course yes uh so something i've heard um i don't want to say frequently but I've heard it from you know some pretty big reputable individuals out there, um, and I'll say when I say it, you might be able to kind of jump in and, and remind me who has said something similar to this recently. Um, but there's there's uh, this kind of message of um, you know the, the common belief for the for the vast majority of people and for a very long time is that diversity is key. Right, spread your when it comes to investing, you want to spread your capital over a broad base of uncorrelated assets, and that should theoretically hedge off the downside risk because they shouldn't all tank all at one time. And what I've heard from you know some pretty big reputable guys is like, yeah, that's that sounds great and all, but if you're really trying to get wealthy and you're really trying to excel in life, you've got to like zero in on one thing and just go really hard at that. So the complete opposite of uh, diversity or uh, diversification, really just hyper focus uh, on 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 the thing you know and understand best. Which, you know, that sounds pretty good, uh, and that's what we've been doing, and that's what I've been doing for many years now. And I it was kind of looking at the uh, uh, the math recently and chatting with Anthony, and then uh, uh, you know, I, for a long time I kind of operated under that mentality. It's like I know real estate the best. I've got the most control over this. This has got the most asymmetric risk reward. Uh, opportunity available for me based on you know how close I am to the asset, how much control I have, and how how much I understand it, which is great. However, you still got to diversify. It's just something that's got to be a part of the the pie. So as much as I love real estate, uh, I've been getting more intentional lately with trying to spread some capital into some some other long term uh, investments that are not real estate, which is really like swimming. Uh, against the current for me. It's it's really hard to do because I, I feel like this is such a sure thing for me. However, you never know. So yeah, it's it's interesting. The the concept that keeps coming to my mind is the difference between volatility and risk, right? Like risk is a kind of hard thing to quantify and measure. And how people define it is is a little bit different depending on the investor 
or the individual, but risk and volatility aren't necessarily the same thing. And what I want to point out here is that I think the advice, if you want to get uber wealthy of like niching down into one specific thing, like that probably is the right advice, but it's very volatile. That's a thing, right? Like if you're focused on that one, one thing, then the chances are of that thing exploding and you doing extra, like, you know, um, incredibly well are high, but then the chances of that thing also going down to zero are incredibly high. And you're at a very, in a really, really risky position. So if you're not looking to be a billionaire, then you're not looking for like the most volatile things. You're looking for a more stable solution. And that's where most people are. They're not looking to get stupid wealthy. They're looking to say, okay, I want my investments to continue performing as expected. Uh, I want to be able to count on it. I want to be able to draw my my dividends from it on an, a consistent basis. And so you're trying to shrink that volatility. And to do that, diversification is key because if you're over leveraged, whether that's real estate or in tech or Bitcoin or whatever, like you're, you're always at the whims of that one market. And it's the same thing when we talk about uh, investing in a city or a, a certain market is we don't want to invest into a market that has only one single industry like Detroit did in the, in the 2000s. Like we want to have that diversity so that if something goes wrong in that one industry, there are others to buoy it in that marketplace. Well said, well said. Well, thank you. Okay. So that's good advice. It's, it's an interesting, interesting one. I think it's not a, a like one size fits all solution. Again, you have to understand your parameters and where you exactly. are in your investing career. Like for us, where we are now, it's like, okay, it's time to take a little bit of the, the volatility off the table and, and, and hedge against that. So, yeah, I think that's the key. The key right there is that it, it, this isn't a static state of mind, it's a fluid concept that is going to be uh, changing and adjusting based on what Anthony just said. Like, where are you in your life early on? You know, in our you know, the earlier stages of our, our our business building days here, which we'll kind of dive into, uh, it would have been silly to not be 100 focused on that one thing. Uh, but as that machine gets built, and as as the you know the the, the payouts start to come and the, and the dividends start to come, that's where you start to kind of park some things off the side. So I think it's you know there's no like Anthony said, there's a one size fits all answer uh, because it's incredibly unique, and even for the same individual uh, that that. Uh, the correct approach and strategy is going to change uh, throughout their life. So definitely, definitely. It's funny. It's like billionaires are all focused on capital pres preservation, which if you're poor, poor and you have no money, like I did, you know, 15 years ago, capital preservation doesn't do me any good because I didn't have it. There's nothing to so preserve. It's not, it's not what I'm thinking about. <laughs> right. So yeah. Like, yeah. You, you change with the times, I guess. Mm -hmm. So, so let's go back to the beginning. Let's talk about the, you know, how we met and, and the formation of Invictus and, and what that what that looked like. So walk me walk me through the story from your perspective. Yeah. So I mean, you know, going way back to like you know how we even got into real estate, uh, which got us into the circle, the the real estate world, which is what kind of brought us together. Like you know, initially, what got me into it was. Uh, I've always been obsessed with uh, with investing ever since a very young age. I developed a, uh, I would say, a healthy obsession with uh, with money when I was a child. Uh, I grew up in a very uh, kind of lower middle class household, so it was there wasn't much money around, and so I, I was very aware of um, uh, this this concept, uh, or, or I should say, the, the concept of money appeared to be this kind of thing that was over here that was like a fantasy and a dream you know, lots of money and wealth. That was always kind of like uh, a pipe dream. Uh, so kind of how it was uh, presented in my household. The, you know, the the Krugers, you know, if we were to ever accumulate wealth, it would be from something like winning the lottery, right? That was, that was kind of the vibe that we had was we are, you know, in this kind of, you know, income bracket, and anything outside of that is just uh, a fantasy. And I just accepted that for a very long time, but I was still really obsessed with money because it was, um sensationalized and made to be kind of like this fantasy for me. And so I loved movies as a kid, like about treasure and gold and money. And I got into collecting uh, currency. Um, you know, my parents had some antique coins. I got those I was like, Oh, this is really cool. So I started going to this coin shop at my house. I really like the paper currency. So I'd go and buy all the coolest looking paper currencies from all over the world and frame them up, up on, on my wall as a kid. 
And so when most kids have like, um, you know, sports pennants and posters of athletes and bands and movies, uh, I had money on my wall, which in retrospect is kind of interesting. My parents <laughs> must've been like, that's super interesting. Yeah, this is, this is weird. Uh, but I just thought it was just a fascinating thing. And I just love the look of it and the, just not even like buying stuff with it. I just wanted to accumulate these cool looking pieces of currency, especially the, um, some of the older Chinese currency was just really beautiful. Brazilian currency was, was, was really cool looking. And, you know, the dollar after that just seemed so plain, plain. And basic. These so other plain. currencies yeah. were so colorful and like works of art. So uh, it was a lot of fun. Um, and then kind of fast forward later into life, get into like end of high school, starting to get into college age. And, you know, I start seeing movies like Wall Street and, and Boiler Room. And I get really turned on by this kind of like stock broker image that's presented in, in Hollywood. And I was like, that is really cool. Um, there's something exciting about just kind of going out and like, almost like everyone's got, everyone's got a shot, right? If you can go out there and, and work and, and position yourself correctly, anybody can get to an extremely high level. And uh, this probably ties into that whole kind of like, you, know, you got to win the lottery if you're a Kruger to, to get wealthy. I saw that as like, oh, that's that that's an interesting avenue. So I ended up studying finance in school, uh, thinking that that was going to be my way to kind of be like um, uh, Bud Fox in, in Wall Street and work my way into that world. But, you know, based on when I was graduating, this was post 2008, I graduated college in 2011. And you know, there weren't that many um, um, investment banking jobs around post 2008. That 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 got cut way down. And so anyone just coming out of college, best case scenario, maybe you can be like a junior analyst at like a uh, Charles Schwab or something like that. You could be an investment advisor, which I had didn't appeal to me at all. I didn't want to do retirement planning. I wanted to be like you know in the bullpen on people screaming and craziness. That's what I was looking for. So I ended up in corporate finance. Um, very good learning experience, uh, but did not scratch the itch I wanted to scratch, you know, that investing itch, that, that, that trading itch. So I've been very active in trading throughout college, whether it's futures, options, stocks, uh, Forex for about five minutes, lost money really quickly in that, didn't really understand the leverage component when I started playing around with it. Um, it was just trying things, playing around. It was kind of like a video game for me. And then, uh, you know, I kind of kept up with that a little bit in in uh, my corporate career, always on the side. Like event, sometimes I'd throw on like an option position or something like that. Uh, I'd kind of dabble and dip my toe in and out of the water, but didn't take it real seriously. Um, but uh, during the corporate job, I got a uh, a sidekick started, a side hustle. I was providing uh, nutrition coaching services, effectively acting like a consultant and a coach for people who wanted to either lose weight or gain muscle or do something. Um, I did the food piece for them. It's very quantitative exercise. I understood it very well um, and realized that I was actually a lot more entrepreneurial than I thought I was. For five years, I was trying to uh, cram a, a, a square peg into a round hole, which is effectively me in a corporate environment. That was pitched as the thing to do. That was the path. That's what my parents... Uh, really presented on a pedestal because they went to art school and my sister went to art school. And so everyone was effectively educated in the arts, but didn't really have any valuable skills and, or they didn't see themselves as having valuable skills in like a corporate setting. So they're like, wow, if you want to have any chance at, you know, just being middle-class, like go to college, get a job at a big company, get benefits, like that's, that's what you do. I did that and I was miserable. And that's where I kind of started dabbling with, uh, you know, the entrepreneurial books. I should say dabbling. I was going hard into how to build a business, how to build a brand, how to market yourself. And, and very closely related to all those books is uh, personal develop, development along with business development. And very closely related to those types of books is real estate. So, you know, this is around when, you know, YouTube's getting bigger and podcasts are getting bigger. And I was just listening to podcasts all day long. And, you know, just by the algorithms doing what they do, the audio book of Rich Dad Poor Dad popped up and I was running out of content. I was sitting there at my corporate job, just listening to audio books and podcasts all day long. And I was like, I just need something, you know, to, to stimulate my brain because what I was doing was incredibly boring. And that one came up and I was like, I've heard about this. It's always seemed so gimmicky and cheesy. The title is like whatever. And I listened to it and uh, it's really cliche to say, but that really did spark uh, some interest. There were a couple of key points in there that really turned me on to real estate in a way that I hadn't looked at it before. And then I went down the rabbit hole. And then 
uh, you know, then we start to kind of get into, into that space. So, so that's kind of my evolution from where I grew up into finding that, 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 that real estate thread and starting to kind of go down that path um, before I just go down that, that piece of the the story, I'd be kind of interested to hear about how Anthony, I mean, I already know, I'm not going to lie, uh, but I'd be interested to hear more about <laughs> how you kind of found your way into just the real estate concept. And then we can kind of dive into what we actually did and how we ended up uh, actually teaming, teaming up. Yeah. Real estate was always an interesting thing for me in the sense that the universe kept putting it in front of me at multiple, multiple junctures. And I just never really paid attention to the universe signaling that, but like to even go like further back to like rewind before real estate, like the, the thing that I tell people that you really have to understand about me, if you want to understand how I got here is that I have like really, 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 really bad ADHD. Like when I was a kid, um, it was a, it was a very defining diagnosis for me in the sense that I was put on Ritalin, which really made me feel trapped and really made me feel confined inside my body. Because what that does, and a lot of people aren't familiar with Ritalin, like for the normal brain, when you take Ritalin, it's a stimulant. It's the way that you stay up all night and you study for a test. But for me, uh, I think it's um, meth, right? Yeah. It's like meth. Yep, yeah, exactly. It's Pretty similar. Much. And but, but what, what ends up happening is for somebody with ADHD, like if you think about it, like a, an engine, we're already operating at a higher RPM. And so what Ritalin does is it pushes us over our internal governor. It trips the system and it resets us and it, it puts us into what's known as a hyper-focused state. But one of the side effects of that drug for me was it took all my energy. It took, it took everything out of me and it just put me into this really focused state all the time. And what that did was it really made me feel trapped. Like all the time I felt trapped inside my body and when I wasn't on the drug, when that would wear off, um, and I get a little rambunctious. It, my mom was trained uh, to to confine me, to turn herself into like a human straitjacket and like wrap her arms and legs around me. If I got too rambunctious, I started thrashing. She would just hold me until I would thrash it all out. And so like there was like this push and play between like always feeling trapped when I was growing up by this this diagnosis. And so when I got off that drug, when I was 16, I decided I'm never doing that again. And I wanted to be free because that's like my highest ideal. My highest value is freedom to be able to go do what I want, when I want, where I want. And I share all of that because coming out of college, I knew I couldn't go work for somebody. Like it felt like I was trapped if I would, and I was, I wasn't a very good employee to begin with. So I went in search of ways that I could pursue my freedom. And that led me to rock climbing professionally for a number of years. And then that led me to writing books, like things that would allow me to control my life and not have anybody else have any say in what I was doing. And the thing about me is that I'm very, very competitive. Like I, I turn everything into a game and I'm always keeping score and it's not keeping score with other people. It's always keeping score with myself and trying to like beat my previous self. And so when a buddy came to me and was like, Hey, I'm building this window washing business. Do you want to help me do that? I was like, yeah, let's do that. That sounds fun. But I was never entrepreneurial. Like I wasn't the kid plucking up flowers and selling it back to the neighbor. Like that wasn't me at all. So this was my first foray into that. And what I discovered was that a lot of the things that I had to figure out in order for me to control my ADHD and be a functioning member of society those same skills were actually really beneficial for building businesses. And I really liked building businesses because it was a way of keeping score. Like when you get a new customer, that's like a way of putting another plus one in the column of like, oh, that person voted for this. They like this. Or every dollar coming in is a way of saying like, oh, new high score. And so that was like the fun part of it for me. In real estate, it really was never about the real estate or even money in particular. It was just another is another game to play in, in, a, in a lot of ways where I'm like, you know, we can go and we can serve these people. And for every tenant or every resident we put into our property and for every dollar we bring in, like, this is another way of playing a game. And like, let's see what we can build with this. Um, and that's the thing that I'm really fascinated with, um, with Invictus is like building this, this game that for me, the rules of like how you win is like, how many lives you can positively impact. It's not really about like how many dollars we bring or anything like that. It's like how many residents, how many employees, how many investors, how many lives can we positively impact? And that's the score by which I'm like, I'm, I'm playing that game. And so that's, 
that's how I think about it. And that's kind of like my weird, it's very different than your journey because like we just come from such different backgrounds, but it's interesting because I think our perspectives and our personalities, they mesh really well. And that's just something that we discovered when we first met, which was at a conference, a, a networking event. And I think, I think that story is really interesting because like I'm, I'm really introverted. I don't like people generally, I, or at least that was a limiting belief I had for many years is that I don't like people. And it's not that it's not that I don't like people it's that I'm uncomfortable around new people. And so I went into that conference saying like, I just need to go meet one person. That's all I got to do. And so I walked into the conference hall, looked around, like there's hundreds of people, tables everywhere, people sitting at all the tables, but there's one table where nobody's sitting. And so I go sit at that table all by myself. And then next thing I know, this muscly guy in a black V-neck is sitting down next to me. I'm like, hey, I wear black V-necks too. And we start talking and the rest is history. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, that's kind of where the, the paths cross for the first time. And I think it's interesting to note as well that my initial draw into just investing in, in real estate was in the pursuit of money. And uh, I'd already noticed in the corporate path that like just following money doesn't really get you what you want. I could have made you know pretty good money in the corporate setting, but the the bottom line I was I was unhappy, and so there was something missing there. I didn't I didn't enjoy the day to day process. I didn't feel like I was building anything. And when I did that that side business and had an entrepreneurial uh, experience, I discovered the the joy of uh, not only you know having control over um, uh, your money because when you're an entrepreneur, you get paid effectively for what you put in or in the corporate world, uh, you know, if you're in sales, yes, you, you, you do get your compensation based on how much hustle you have, but for a corporate financial analyst, it, you get your salary. And if you work twice as hard, there's not really much of a, a benefit there. And so it wasn't a correlation. And when I had that business, I was like, okay, the thing that initially drew me in was yes. I, if I work harder, I make more money. Uh, the thing that I also found out was that it's incredibly satisfying, uh, to, also get compensated by helping people and providing value, um, which was great because then, you know, sometimes in the consulting space and, you know, any business, anytime you're a self-employed individual, it's, it's up and down, right? There's good months and there's bad months. And so if there was times when I wasn't making as much capital as I wanted, then, you know, worst case scenario for me, it was like, if I could at least help people, then I feel good about what I'm doing with my time. It's not wasted time. And I, I really got to enjoy the process of, of building the business, building the machine, just like uh, just like Anthony said. So I got turned on to these other aspects of it that I didn't realize I had a passion for until I actually did them and felt them. And then I'm like, oh wow, this is really cool. I get paid in multiple different ways. Um, you know, I get paid by the satisfaction of helping people and providing value. I get paid by uh, the satisfaction of building. And, and making this big, impressive machine, uh, whatever it is, whether it's a consulting business or a real estate business or whatever business you want to start, it's effectively a big machine, a big puzzle, a big sculpture that you're making. And it's you can just create this, this entity out of nowhere, which is uh, really rewarding. And so all these other aspects of it really turned me on. And then, you know, it doesn't take long once you get into the active real estate space, you're going to start making some pretty decent money right away. So it really quickly shifted from how much money can we make to how big of an impressive machine can we build, right? How far can we take this? Like how, how many jobs can we create? How many uh, communities can we improve? And it became about something bigger because uh, as soon as you get, you know, X amount of dollars, like the incremental value received uh, or the incremental happiness uh, that you receive from making more money starts to diminish. And I can attest to that. Um, after a certain point, you're not ha incrementally happier with each additional dollar. You know, you basically have that kind of payoff in happiness up until you get to the point where you can support yourself and live the kind of lifestyle you want. And then beyond that, it's kind of negligible. So you really do need to find something else to focus on. And Anthony and I had both been through that process already. And when we met, we were very much aligned you know, philosophically and, and morally. Um, and we weren't even looking for partners when we met. We were just kind of there doing the thing, like doing the networking thing. This is it was, it was still a newer business to us. And so we just showed up. I showed up to meet people and learn and just kind of insert myself in the network. And no one was really looking for partners, I think, which was uh, part of the cool part. It was a very organic process of coming to the realization that uh, there's a really good opportunity here right in front of us. It's one of those times that the universe actually puts uh, an opportunity in front of us and we both realized it in real time. 
Because like mm-hmm. Anthony said, there's a lot of times when the universe will position a really great opportunity in front of you and you are not, your eyes aren't open. You're not ready to uh, be aware of it and, and it passes you by. So luckily he and I were both in a similar state with our, um, you know, our, our mental game, our, our self-awareness and our, 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 our uh, focus on our goals. And we were able to see this great opportunity in front of us, which is in retrospect, really, uh, you know, lucky, I guess, for lack of a better Very word. Very fortuitous. I, I I never, I didn't grow up thinking a lot about entrepreneurship or business or anything like that. But one of the things I've been really fortunate to like have in my life and the opportunity to like build businesses and see this in real time is that entrepreneurs change the world, man. Like they they have so much impact. You can have so much impact by building a business. And it's for me, my first 28 years on this planet, I really struggled with a concept that I've been, I've been thinking about a lot in the last couple of years, which is the, the science of achievement versus the art of fulfillment. And the science of achievement is like, how do I go win the award? How do I build that business? How do I go get that money? And you go do that. If the money becomes your focus, you go, you go get it. Like if you want to learn the game and you want, that's what you want, you can do it. It's the science. You follow these steps. If you want to be rich, do these things. It's pretty simple, but that doesn't necessarily lead to fulfillment. And art, the art of fulfillment is different than the science of achievement because it's not replicatable for everybody. Everybody's like what fulfills them is different. And so there's not like this book you can read or the system that you can implement that's going to say like, if you do this, you will be fulfilled. It's like, it's, it's an art. It's very tricky. And what I discovered for myself was my, my younger years were very focused on achieving because I thought that would lead to a f- to fulfillment, but it doesn't because they're fundamentally different mediums. And the example I use is that it's like fulfillment means that there is some lack, right? There's a hole in you. And you're trying to fill that hole with achievement. But if that hole is made out of concrete and you're trying to fill it with spaghetti noodles, it will never be full. It's not the same medium, right? And that's that was the mistake that I was making when I was young was like trying to fill achievement and, and, f- and try to f- find fulfillment. And since we started building businesses and like it was Invictus, like the focus really is about not the achievement, but what's the impact that we're having on the residents and the investors to our employees. And that's where you get like, re- I get really energized and really jazzed about that because it goes back to what I said before about entrepreneurs change the world. Like, and that's the coolest thing. They change, mm-hmm. they change the lives of individuals, which then go on to change the lives of communities, which go on to change the lives of cities. And it's like, the sky's the limit. And I think that's just like the most motivating thing. When we go and look at a new apartment complex or new investment opportunity, it's not about the dollar signs. It's about like all the lives that are going to be positively impacted from that one transaction. And that's just, it's amazing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think the, one of the things that could be extrapolated from what we said so far here by listeners is uh, a, if you've, if you're looking for some kind of partnership or, or if, if that's on your radar, you've got to already have done a lot of self-work and be very self-aware of who you are, uh, what makes you happy, like Anthony said, what your skill sets are uh, and what your skill sets aren't. Um, you know, we've talked about a book called Who Not How multiple times across multiple episodes of podcasts. And that book talk, talks a lot about just getting real with yourself and like, okay, what am I good at? And, and what do I suck at? And just being like, really honest with yourself, like what makes me happy and what am I good at? If you know those things and another potential partner also knows those things, kind of like me and Anthony, then it's a really easy fit. It's like it either fits or doesn't, and you know, pretty quickly, uh, assuming someone passes like the the ethical and and morality tests, you know, if they're self-aware and you're self-aware and you both know exactly what it is that that you're lacking and and bringing to the table, then, you know, the, the piece the pieces fitting together become quite clear, but I think the vast majority of people just haven't done that much uh, introspective work on themselves and they haven't uh, become self-aware enough to effectively go out there and and navigate the world and, and figure out where they need to insert themselves. Yeah. 100%. Got nothing to add there. It's self-awareness is the key. If you want to build, if you want to find a partnership or if you want to succeed in life, because success is uh, however you want to define it, you have to be able to define it for yourself. And you can't define it for yourself until you have a little 
level yeah. of self-awareness to it sounds silly to say because it's like really simple but there's like so many people just haven't gone through that process because it's hard to look inside yourself and, and mm-hmm. pop the hood on your own brain especially because a lot of the stuff they're gonna have to do is subconscious right you've got to yeah, like, figure out like the the uh the 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 loops the the sound bites in your head that you can't even hear but are influencing your actions there's a lot of mm-hmm. stuff underneath the surface that's going on that impacting your behavior in your life and if you haven't really tried to take a look at that it's going to be really hard to figure out exactly uh who you are and yeah what you need and and a, and a, and a perfect case in point of that is what i said earlier when i when i slipped up and i said i don't like people right and i was like that was a limiting belief that for so long in my life, I believed because it was just on this automatic loop. And it yeah. wasn't until I like heard it for the first time and thought about it. I was like, well, it's not that I don't like people. It's that it makes me uncomfortable. People make me uncomfortable. And that's a different thing. And that's, that's a harder self-awareness. It's easier to say like, oh, I just don't like them. And so realize that like self-awareness is the game and it's constantly changing. Like what made you happy last year might not still be the thing that makes you happy this year. So it's a, it's an ongoing process. So this is this got really philosophical our origin story. But honestly, when you start thinking back on We're the beginning, to like guys. makes sense exactly. Yeah, I mean, when you think about like what got you here and where you came from, like those are the journeys that matter more than the physical journey of like oh, then we acquired this building and we acquired that building. Like that's mechanical. It's the it's the software. It's the the operating system behind it that's the more interesting, and that's that's all philosophical. So. You 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 alluded to a book there. Let's let's walk our let's walk our beautiful audience out of this episode with another book recommendation. Mm-hmm. You got you got something good yeah, on I you? Feel like, yeah, yeah. I've I've recommended that one. So you know, we'll we'll I'll, I'll mention again just to remind people uh, what we're talking about: the Who Not How book by uh, Benjamin Hardy Benjamin. and Dan Sullivan. There it is. Yes, great book. That's not the recommendation for today, even though we do recommend it. Uh, Don't we go read that, that one recently. Uh, we've used that one so many times. <laughs> Yeah, I'm going to recommend one. I can never remember what we've recommended. So stop me if we've recommended this one. But okay. another one that's that's just really um, uh, on the top of our, our uh, radar right now or, or on top of at, at top of mind for us right now is uh, Buy Then Build. Have we recommended this? Yeah, we did. We did. Darn it. Um, that's okay. I got, I got one. Yeah. So it, this goes back, and this isn't going to be a book for everybody. If you're an entrepreneur, this is if you're interested in building businesses, if you hear our story, if you're a real estate investor and you're trying to build a thing, you hear our story and you're like, I want to, I want to pursue that. That sounds cool. A uh, book that I'm reading right now is by Alex Mar. I can't think of his name now. Uh, Hermosi, Alex Hermosi. It's called "Make Offers So Good That People Will Feel Stupid to Say No." make offers so good that people will feel stupid to say no. And it's about marketing and making offers, but there's a lot of deep philosophy in these books. What what I find so fascinating about marketing in general is that it's just applied human psychology in mass. Like how do we drive human behavior in a group of people? And you as a human, you are just one of those people. And if you can understand what motivates the group, you can come to a better self-awareness as well. So again, like it all ties together. Self-awareness is the the key. Hundred percent, hundred percent. Not an easy process, but well worth the effort. Best investment you'll ever make. So mm-hmm. unless you invest with Invictus Capital, I'm just saying that's a pretty good one too. It's so. a pretty good one. So. All right. That's going to do it for us, guys. We appreciate you taking the time to listen to our stories as we uh, pontificate wildly about our origins. Now, before you leave, do us a favor. Go pick up Passive Investing Made Simple. It's over on Amazon. Go pick it up and uh, enjoy. Enjoy it. Have fun with it. There's some good stories in there as we we crack open the shell of who we are and how we got here. Um, There's also a lot of technical information about how do you actually find a deal worth investing in? How do you find operators worth working with? Uh, so go pick that up. Do us a favor. If you enjoy it, go and leave a review. If you don't enjoy it, keep your criticism to yourself. We don't want to hear from you. Only if you love it, go leave a review and we'll see you guys next week. 